Good morning, and welcome to the worship service here at the Snellville United Methodist Church, where we are welcoming all people into a growing relationship with Jesus. And the beautiful thing about that is this, no matter if you're two or 102, we are all on this spiritual journey together, and we are all trying to grow closer and cl closer to Christ as we walk along this path. So if you're in person or if you're online, you are part of this body of Christ that we call Snellville UMC. If you are in person, we want to invite you to pick up that black pad folio and fill it out with your attendance and pass it along the pew. And if you're online, there is a, a link in the comments section that you can click on and register your attendance so that we know you're here and, and we can reach out to you if you would like us to and, and maintain contact with you. I want to draw your attention to um, two special announcements this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, upcoming June the 6th. June the 6th, we are having what we call Monday Fun Day at the Southeast Gwinnett Co-op. And on that evening from 4 until 7 p.m. at the Gwinnett County Co-op, we will be serving meals to 200 guests. And these meals are being prepared by our uh, Methodist men here at our church. But we need help in serving those meals to the drive-through um, service that's provided. So if you would like to um, deliver meals to people's cars, if you would like to pray with people as they ask for prayer concerns, or if you'd like to serve in the food pantry while we're working from four until seven, um, please email Margie um, Tutton and, and let us know that you'd be willing to serve on that um, day. Also, what we'd like to do is we'd like to give a special treat to our recipients of the meal, and we would like to provide their children with a book. Uh, so we're asking for donations of books from, you know, early on preschool up through middle school and maybe even high school, whatever, whatever you'd like to provide for. But if you're going out and, and purchasing books, or if you've got some very nicely, gently used books, um, think about those older kids, those chapter books. You know, um, Think about those books. And if you could bring those to the church, where um, our goal is by June the 2nd. So that's up and coming. Um, and you can bring those to Wesley Hall, or if you have any questions, come to the front office, and we'll, we'll steer the way. Also, uh, summer is around the corner, although it already feels like summer, I think. But uh, our su summer sermon series, that is a tongue twister. Sermon, summer, summer, ugh. Okay, I said it once, so that's all I have to say it. We're having a summer road trip, and that series is beginning on June the 5th, which is Pentecost Sunday. And during the summer, we'll we're discussing our faith journey as it relates to summer road trips and, um, and preparing for the journey. And, you know, we've, we've all packed bags. Well, some of those bags are essential, and some of those bags need to be left behind. Also, uh, we'll be having some camp uh, meetings style worship in July, and we'll be, we'll be singing songs and stories to tell, and you don't want to miss that trip. So, uh, summer road trip. I think we have a video. A 
Okay, our, our hope is that your summer road trip does not go quite that way um, and that you'll have a great journey. Um, as we continue the worship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I invite you to join with me in our call to worship. Jesus answered, Whoever loves me will keep my word. The Holy Spirit was sent to us to remind us.
I'm Quincy Brown, and I'm pleased to be the senior <coughs> pastor here at Snellville United Methodist Church. It is good to be here. This is a good Sunday morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. God inhabits the praises of God's people. Do you believe that? If you believe that, then let's give a round of applause and give God some praise this morning. God is worthy of all of our praise. God is good. Even when things are bad, God is still good. And we have the privilege to go to the creator of the universe, and he listens to us. No matter how big or how insignificant we think our concerns are. And so it is my pleasure and my honor and joy this morning to lead us in prayer. We have some concerns that we want you to know about. This afternoon at 2 o'clock, we will have the memorial service for Specialist Etienne Murphy here in our sanctuary. Uh, he is an alum of the South Gwinnett uh, High School, and he served as a ranger, and he was uh, killed in action. And so we're going to have his service here as an outreach to our community. So we ask that you remember this family. Also, for those of us who are clergy, we got news on Thursday that one of our own had passed. And so I ask that you remember the family of Reverend Marita Harrell. She is the pastor of Connections Metropolitan. She was uh, 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 tragically killed uh, by mentoring a young man. And so uh, it's been all over the news. And so this morning, a church without a pastor. And so let's continue to pray for those. We also want to lift up those who are in our military, those who have medical cons concerns, those who are suffering from cancer, uh, those who are uh, protecting our freedoms, our medical workers who are on the front line, and you, whatever concern that you may have. Prayer is the language of people who are dependent on God. I'll say that again. Prayer is the language for people who are dependent on God. So whether you have super faith or baby faith, or you feel like you have no faith at all, you can let your request be known to God, and God wants to hear from you. And so I invite you to lift your prayers up to God, remembering these individuals. Good morning, God. We want to say thank you for just being God. God, we want to thank you for your goodness. We want to thank you for your power, your power to take our mess and give us a message your power to take our test so that we can have a testimony. Oh God, we just want to say thank you this morning for waking us up. You didn't have to do it, but you did, and for that we say thank you. And God, whether we're here in person or watching across the country online, you've been good to us. There are many things, God, that are swirling in our world, swirling in our minds and in our families. So, God, we ask that you would hear our prayers. Someone in this gathering needs a healing word. Come by here, O oh God. 
Some are struggling with big decisions to make. Some of us are going through transitions where there's a personal transition with a job or health transitions or family issues. Some of us, oh God, have had arguments where we've said things that we probably ought not have said and we're too ashamed to admit that we probably need to ask for forgiveness. But God, some of us are doing things on the down low that we don't want other folks to know about, but God, you know. We're struggling. Would you have mercy upon us, God? Well, God, help us to be an obedient church, a church that welcomes all people into a growing relationship with Jesus. So God, whether we have crazy faith or baby faith, would you forgive our sins for their many? Free us to be an obedient church. And we make this prayer, O oh God, in the name of the one who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In a moment, we're going to have our offering. This is a part of worship where you can give back to God a portion of what God has given you. So we will take our tithes, God's tithes, and our offering. But before we do that, I'd like to call your attention to the screen, and I'll return shortly. Putting the offering into the offering plate was part of a form of worship for me. So I was very reluctant when people started talking about recurring giving and giving online, because I thought that would take that worship journey away. God said to give the first fruits. That means not waiting until the end of the month to see what you have left to give. With recurring giving, the giving is taken care of for you. It comes off the top. So for me, recurring giving is important because I just wanted to make sure that I don't have something like not going to church as an excuse why I couldn't tithe or give my givings to the church. I've used a recurrent giving tool for two, possibly three years. I'll admit that when it was first introduced, I did not sign up because I had been taught that the plate is passed and you put money in. Then COVID came and there was no more in-person church, no passing of the plate, and I thought, give it a try. I'll admit, I love it. As part of the finance team, as we were um, watching the giving, we would notice that there was a dip, particularly in the summer months when people were going on vacation. So I said, well, if I'm part of the team, maybe I ought to try it for the team. When I did a recurring giving, it made it absolutely easy because I'm able to budget just like with all my finances and I know that in every pay period it's already done just like if I was going to do any other of my finances. It allows me to go in, I tell it how much money to come out, the uh, date each month it's to come out, and then I indicate uh, what credit card that I want it to come out of. So it's just been a really great budgeting tool for me. I don't have to worry where I stand on my pledge. Instead of doing the bank draft, I actually do it through a credit card. And it just happens to be one of the cash back credit cards. So I was able to give a little more and not worry during worship service about putting that envelope in the offering plate. Then I could spend that time worshiping God and thanking Him for all the blessings that He was giving us. Don't allow giving to be susceptible to circumstances. If you're traveling or if you're sick or you can't make it to church, it's all done for you. Recurring giving is freeing. And if you do face a sudden financial crisis or something, it's, it's easy to pause it or, or, or modify it until you get back on your feet again, so you're not trapped by it at all. If you really 
are committed to the ministry of Jesus and committed to what Snellville is to do, and you want to make sure that that happens, recurring giving is one best way. Because with everything else we do financially, we make sure that those things get done, and this should be the first thing to be done before we do any other finances. Friends, thank you for your generosity. We appreciate your consistent giving because consistent giving is the key to help our church with this mission and ministry as we welcome all people into a growing relationship with Jesus. Will you join me and others throughout the church to be all in with recurring giving? God bless you. We're truly grateful for those of you that have started recurring giving. There are several ways to give here at Snellville United Methodist Church. You just heard about recurring giving. You can give online on our website. You can give by mailing your check in, or you can give in person. If you are online, we'd ask that you follow the comment section. Our online host has provided a link that you can give. Here in person, we have offering plates at each exit as you go out. We ask that you place God's gifts in those baskets. We're grateful for your generosity. When you give to Snellville United Methodist Church, you help us to make an impact in our local community and around the world. So thank you for your generosity. I also want to take just a moment to lift up um, a story or an, a concern that is happening here. On Friday, we had our preschool, preschool celebration. Our kindergartners and our pre-K students stood on this stage, and we had parents where you're sitting applauding them. It was their day. In June, we are going to have vacation Bible school. Here is the good news. Are you ready for it? We have 120 kids registered to show up for vacation Bible school this summer. 90% of those kids are from the community. That means that 90% of those families have never stepped foot in this church. And so for the first time, we have an opportunity to make an impact with these families. Part of our emphasis is community engagement and families with small children. Here is where we need you. We need 14 more people to be able to make this vacation Bible school a success. Friends, if we don't get 14 people, we're going to have to turn some of these kids away. And I don't know about you, but I don't like turning people away from the church. And so, here's what we need. Here's how you can help. Raise your hands if you are a grandparent. Raise your hand if you are a grandparent. If you're online, just type into the chat that you're a grandparent. What we need this uh, Vacation Bible School is what you grandparents do with your grandchildren. You're just a guide. You don't have to do any teaching. You don't have to do any feeding. All we need is for people like you, 14 of you, to walk around with our kids and show them some love. Love them like you love your grandkids, because they're somebody's grandkids too. And so, if God's putting on your heart to serve, out in the gathering room, if you're here in person, online, if you would put in the chat that you love to serve, we will follow up with you. Out in the gathering room at the next step table is a sign-up sheet. If you will put your name and contact information we will follow up with you. I'm going to be there 
and I hope to see you there. We want to make an impact of the lives of 120 kids who have never stepped foot in this church. God bless you. Thank you in advance for your service. your Bibles, you can open them to Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 28. If you don't have your Bible, it'll be up on the screen, or you can use one of the uh, Bibles in the pew in front of you. Um, This is what the Lord, word of the Lord says. From Miletus, he, Paul, sent a message to Ephesus, calling for the church's elders to meet him. When they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived among you the whole time I was with you, beginning with the first day I arrived in the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears in the midst of trials that came upon me because of the Jews' schemes. You know I held back nothing that would be helpful so that I could proclaim to you and teach you both publicly and privately in your homes. You know I have testified to both Jews and Greeks that they must change their hearts and lives and live as they turn to God and have faith in our Lord Jesus. Now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. 
I don't know what will happen to me there. What I do know is that the Holy Spirit testifies to me from city to city that prisons and troubles await me. But nothing, not even my life, is more important than my completing my mission. This is nothing other than the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify about the good news of God's grace. I know that none of you will see me again, you among whom I travel and proclaim the kingdom. Therefore, today I testify to you that I'm not responsible for anyone's fate. I haven't avoided proclaiming the entire plan of God to you. Watch yourselves in the whole flock in which the Holy Spirit has placed you as supervisors to shepherd God's church, which he obtained with the death of his own son. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So here I am. It's May 22nd. Uh, I'm wearing a robe um, and I'm leaving. So it feels like this is a graduation speech. Um, so you did it. What a long, strange trip it's been. And, and I mean that because I started here in January of 2020. Uh, Jim and Quincy brought me on board here, and turns out what they did was to bring me on board as the pandemic pastor. Um, it's kind of like a baseball team who really needs a pitcher that can pitch to a camera with nobody in the crowd. Um, that's what I've done. That's what I did for y'all for the first year or so. Um, so to go over some of my greatest hits with y'all, to remind you in case uh, you don't remember or if you weren't there, um, I started off the pandemic with preaching a sermon where at the end of it you realized I was in my bathing suit. Um, and then we did the floor is lava. I explained what the floor is lava is. And if you don't remember, it's say I want to get to the back of the room and I've got to get there without touching the floor. I would use the altar and probably push the the, uh, the kneeling cushions out and hop over the seats. And I did it in the video, the girls and I hopped, and then we climbed up on the kitchen counter and I made my way around to the refrigerator in the video. Um, and that was your worship service that morning. But then we moved to the parking lot. Do y'all remember drive-in worship? All right. And so I preached on the Mighty Ducks and I made you guys honk your horns in unison uh, to explain the, uh, the biblical nature of community as, as one does when we talk about the Disney movie the Mighty Ducks. And then lastly, uh, Audrey and I did, uh, uh, did an experiment and found out that the vaccine does not cause infertility. Um, <laughs> so this is, the, this is the fourth church that I've said goodbye to in my ministry. And every time I leave, somebody comes up to me, or multiple people usually come up to me and say, you have grown so much in the time that you've been with us. And what I think, I'd like to think that my ability to preach in my career has been on this upward trajectory for the last nine years. But what I think it is, is that I take a long time to get used to. And so y'all put up with the jokes more and more, week after week after week, and then by the end of it, you're like, ah, I kinda like him. We'll see what the new guy has. But uh, that's where we're at. So. Beyond that, though, most importantly, as Paul says in this passage, I hope that I preached the gospel. I hope that I preached that God has a plan to put the world back together, that Jesus won the decisive victory over Satan by defeating death and sin on the cross, that Jesus' resurrection means that we can all be made new, that his ascension means that he is king over all, and that Pentecost... What we'll celebrate in a couple weeks means that we now have the power to carry on his mission. In the passage, Paul is saying farewell. If you, if you need a, a, quick, uh, um, a, quick, uh, a quick update on who Paul is, just a reminder of who Paul is. So Jesus dies, he rises again, he, he ascends into heaven, and he sends his disciples out on mission. And there's a guy named Saul who his name means Paul in Greek. He didn't get a name change like Abraham. It was Saul in Hebrew, Paul in Greek. And he, uh, he's persecuting these Christians because he is a devout Jew. He knows the Bible backwards and forwards. In fact, he's a disciple of one of the greatest teachers of the time, a guy named Gamaliel. And he wants to make sure that what happened in the exile doesn't happen again, that People forgot about God, and they're not following God anymore. And so he's going around trying to make sure everybody is following the law perfectly. And he's trying to honor God with his life. He's giving it everything he has. But what it means to him is to stamp out all these things he sees as heresy. And so he's going from town to town to town looking to try to get these Christians arrested. Uh, he's affirming when they get killed. Like he, 
he thought that he was doing the right thing, but then Jesus shows up to them, shows up to him on the road to Damascus and says, no, I am who they say I am. I am the Messiah. You should follow me. And, you, and so all of that energy, all of that passion, all of that commitment that he was trying to give God, persecuting the Christians, he turns around and gives that to serving uh, Jesus and to preaching his name. And so he starts all these churches all over the Middle East, and one of them was Ephesus. And he spent more time in Ephesus than he did any other town uh, and in any other church that he worked with. And so he's coming near the end of his ministry. He doesn't know that it's going to be the end of his ministry, but he wants to go back to Jerusalem for Pentecost. And then he wants to go to Rome and then to Spain to, to share the gospel even farther. And so he thinks he's not going to see the Ephesians again because of that. But what he doesn't know is, uh, what he doesn't know is that uh, um, he's going to get arrested in Israel, and he's going to get sent to Rome and be under house arrest. And what we think, we don't see that in the book of Acts, but what we believe is that he was executed after that. And so he's saying goodbye to them. And he says a few things. He says, first of all, that he lived humbly among them, that he wasn't a charlatan, that he wasn't trying to... Uh, tricked them. He wasn't trying to uh, steal their money. He wasn't trying to have influence over them that he didn't deserve. In fact, if you know much about his ministry, he was a tent maker. So he made his own money instead of asking for money from the churches that he served. It's really important because there was lots of other people coming around saying uh, that he was wrong and that they were trying to uh, manipulate the churches into taking care of them financially. Um, and then he tells them that he preached the gospel, that trials await him. And again, more than he probably thought he was going to face. And now he wants them to continue the mission. So I use this passage this morning, not because I think that I'm Paul, in case you were worried, um, but because I can't, I can't make the claims he did. So first of all, look what he did in this passage. Number one, he went to Miletus. He didn't go to Ephesus. He went to a, some town called Miletus, which was 30 miles away from Ephesus, and said, hey, I want to say goodbye to y'all. We all come by foot mostly. 30 miles for me to say goodbye to you. So I didn't do that to y'all this morning, at least. Um, and then he, uh, but he also planted this church. So he obviously has huge ties to this. But when I look at this passage, I feel convicted and energized and wanting to shape my life like this passage because I don't know if I've done everything right here at Snellville. I don't know if I've said everything I needed to say. He says there's no blood on his hands, that he's not responsible for anybody's fate because he preaches the gospel. Um, you guys seen Stranger Things? <laughs> At first I thought y'all were trying to get my attention. <laughs> anyway, wow, I got a spot on your face now. Um, anyway, <laughs> I hope I've done that. But if I haven't, if I haven't preached the gospel, I'm going to make up for it now. All right, can we do that? All right, the first thing is that Paul says he preached repentance. He preached repentance. Repentance, the Greek word metanoia, means turn around, walk the other direction. A lot of times we think of repentance, if we know what the word means, it's a pretty churchy word as just being sorry or, oh, I feel really bad. But it's to turn around and walk the other direction. The CEB, the translation I use a lot in the 930 service, says he preached changing heart and life. That's what it is. It's I'm changing who I am on the inside. It's going to change who I am on the outside. I'm going a new direction. Repentance. Those are difficult words today. We don't like to hear about repentance in our culture, and they're for various reasons. But I got to say this right here. This is the truth as much as I can see it, as much as I think it's been revealed to us. We are broken, and we can turn around. We are broken, and we can turn around. There's two parts to that. There's we are broken, and there's we can turn around. And our world has a problem with both of those things. This is the idea of original sin. It's the idea of original sin that each one of us, from the get-go, is capable of hurting our neighbor. We see that. I, I've got young kids. They can hurt their neighbors just as much as anybody else. Um, G.K. Chesterton, a famous essayist and, and writer, um, speaker in the early 1900s, a big influence on C.S. Lewis, said, it's interesting that uh, people would deny original sin when it's the easiest to prove. It's the easiest Christian belief to prove. We're broken people, we hurt people. But 
you know, we've had, you know, decades of the idea of self-esteem, which I think is important. Uh, self-esteem being we don't want to feel bad about ourselves. Now, um, you know, I'm a millennial, and I got a lot of participation trophies. I also got championship trophies, and they were bigger than the participation trophies, in case you're worried that I did know the difference between winning and losing. Um, and people like, it's back. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, People like to criticize it, but it was y'all. Y'all gave us the trophies. It was, um, but anyway, there's a difference between shame and guilt. All right? Self-esteem should be about the idea that you are not worthless. No matter what you've done, no matter who you are, you are a loved child of God, and you should not feel like there is no way that you can be of use or of worth to anyone or to God. That's important. We want that. We want you to believe that. But at the same time, we should feel guilty when we do wrong things. And people are like, well, no, guilt's bad. We, the only people that don't feel guilty are sociopaths. You, there are people you know that you want to feel guilty. Maybe you don't want to feel guilty. Maybe you, don't, maybe you feel too guilty. Maybe some people sit in guilt. And I think that leads to shame. But our world doesn't function if people don't feel guilty. If we're not like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I won't do that next time. If we don't do that, we can't move forward in a society. But the problem is we live in a world that, number one, says you're fine just the way you are. And that's fun to tell people. I love to say, oh, you're great just the way you are. And I like saying it because then maybe it's true for me. Hey, I don't need to change. I don't need to worry about any of the stuff I'm dealing with. I could just keep on trucking and not be introspective at all. Because there's another truth in our world is that if you do a wrong thing, depending on wherever I've drawn the line, I'm going to write you off completely. That's what we see in our world. It's that you're fine just the way you are unless you're one of them, in which case there is no hope for you at all. Do you all see that in the world? Um, and that's the left and the right. That's the old and the young. Everybody's been doing that. I mean, that's the Inquisition. And you're like, oh, yeah, those judgy Christians. But then it was the French Revolution. It's, you know, it's the Communist Revolution. It was fascism. It was, you know, the religious right and then now cancel culture. Like we, once we get a little bit of power and a little bit of moral outrage, we start trying to shove everybody down. All right? And we think they're one of those people that can't change or you're doing fine just the way you are. So it's both things. We are broken we can turn around. That's the gospel. It hurts to hear that we're broken, but it's hope to hear that we can turn around and go the other direction. So that means for each one of us, you get 490 chances. You know where I'm getting that number? Peter goes up to Jesus and says, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus said, seven times 70, which if it's been a while, that's 490. Um, but I think it was more poetic than that. We get that many chances for us, and so that means we got to recognize our own brokenness and then keep recognizing it. Be like, oh, I've healed here so I can stop. No, there's other stuff over here that God hadn't shown you yet that we need to heal from. Let God change us, heal us, and then look to the people that we think there's no hope for. Whether it's people in our personal lives that have hurt you over and over again or public figures that you think stand for all the worst parts of our society. And think, God can heal them too. God can redeem them. That's the gospel. Nobody's too far from God, but each one of us has a responsibility to get with God and get healed. Amen? So we be radical. We need to be radical. It's radical to think that I'm flawed. And it's radical to think that my enemies deserve love. So let's start there. Next, Paul says he preached faith. All right? We like faith. We're saved by faith. Faith is the belief in something. It's the ideas that we want to agree to, but it's also an orienting our life to that belief. It's one thing for Jim to believe that that pew is going to hold him. It's another thing for him to actually sit on it. Y'all see the difference? That's what faith is. There's a belief, you know, that this microphone is going to work, and then there's the f actual faith that I'm going to talk through it. And I'm actually not talking through that one. I'm talking through this one. So it's a bad metaphor. Um, we're saved by faith. We're saved by faith that Jesus died and rose again. We're saved by faith that Jesus is Lord and he's healing the world. So it's a hope not, for, not just for eternal life, but also for this life now. It's a faith that calls us out of our comfort and into a new creation life. 
Each one of you, if you have faith in Jesus, you are a new creation. You are a different type of human. We've got to wrestle with that because sometimes we keep getting dragged down by the old stuff that, and we wake up each morning thinking, I'm going to go about my normal routine, but you are different. You are transformed by the Spirit, and that should have an impact on your life and on the people around you. That's what faith looks like. Faith offers love to our neighbors, even if they're weird. Faith that God is making us into a community, not just individuals changed by Jesus, but we should be demonstrating a community of these new creation people where people say, wow, you know, I don't, I don't get those people. They're a little weird, but they sure do love each other and love the community. And faith, like James tells us in the book of James, it turns into action when we trust God. So when we, if we have faith in Jesus, we do the things he tells us to. Faith turns into action. We can all be healed. Like I said, we can all turn around. And we can all offer hope into the world. We can all seek to understand all the crazy new developments I bet each one of us turns on the news every once in a while and looks through our Facebook feeds. I'm a lot younger than a lot of you, but I'm still confused by a lot of the different directions the world is going in. And you'd be like, how did people get there? How did they? It's not my job to hide from it and just be like, ugh. Because each one of y'all, I mean, raise your hand if you did something weird that confused your parents. (laughs) All right. So if y'all, oh, none of (laughs) y'all. (laughs) There. And that's, it's, that's always going to be happening. I mean, there's, there's uh, ancient Greek writers who were complaining about the next generation. Um, instead, we've got to figure out what's going on in this world that's causing them to act the way they are. You know, look for the good in it, look for the bad in it, and speak life into it. Spend our time loving, because loving is attempting to understand. If we want to be a loving neighbor, we've got to figure out what's going on in the world around us. All right? Nothing's new. It's all going around and coming around, except for what God is doing in us. And so we do that, we understand, we love, and then we serve. Serve in church. Uh, Quincy did a whole lot of my sermon talking about VBS. We need y'all, if y'all are concerned about the next generation knowing Jesus, about continuing the mission of this church, then be with the kids, whether it's at VBS in a couple weeks or just at least once a year, spend time in ministry with the kids. Even if you're like, well, I'm not really good with kids. There is something powerful about being with the next generation, connecting with them, trying to figure out how to share your faith in a way that a seven-year-old can understand will help you understand your faith better. Because we bring in all sorts of stuff that we think we understand, but then when someone asks you a question like, what do you actually believe? Sometimes we get tongue-tied. It helps me know how to share with y'all when I try to explain things to my eight-year-old or my six-year-old. So spend time with children because they're going to teach you about your faith ways that you never knew. That's how we can have faith like a child. All right, uh, volunteer for the toolbox ministry, helping keep this building running. Us, I mean, you may think about just this building as being like, oh, that's a lot of finances or that's a lot of, you know, a lot of trappings. But we are creating an environment in here where people are encountering God. If this place was a mess, you would be distracted. You know, if this building was falling down, if there was just a bright light flashing in my face while I was trying to talk, (laughs) you would be distracted. And so we create an environment that's, that's pleasing, that points people to God. Um, And so toolbox ministry or giving through that does that. Or, you know, we want to create an environment where people feel welcome. Volunteer to be an usher or the 930 service, the blue shirts. Find ways to invite people in inside the church. Find your place to serve and say, oh, that's easy. I can do that. And then go find something out of your comfort zone to do as well. But it's not just about what's happening at Snellville UMC. It's also what's happening in the world. If Jesus has changed you, if he's transforming you, if you are a new creation, you should be offering that hope to the world around you. Volunteer at the co-op with that event that Tracy just told you about. Or volunteer in the schools. If you think that the schools around here are different than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago, go serve and offer hope to them instead of just being like, how are they going to fix that? Go to work, look for chances to serve. Whatever clubs you're involved with, look for chances to serve. You know, volunteer with sports, uh, coaching, or just find ways to show God's love regularly. Figure out what is, what do you do regularly that shows God's love to the world around you? And then as you're doing that, know what you believe well enough to share it. 
Because I think sometimes we spend so long in church that when we get down to it, the reason we show up is because we're comfortable here. These are where our friends are. And we forget what drew us here in the first place. Get with God and say, why am I here to begin with? What was it that Jesus did in your life? Because if somebody who doesn't know this community, who's, who doesn't like your friends as much as you do, says, why should I come to church? What's your answer going to be? What powerful thing has God done in your life in long ago that brought you here, but also recently that you would say, if you'll come with me, you can experience something like that. We need to know what we believe well enough to share it. We should spend time in Scripture Studying scripture, studying what God has done, spend time in prayer, being able to say, this past week, this is how God showed up. This city needs this church. It's growing and it's changing, probably in ways that a lot of y'all are confused by or angry about or just kind of throwing up your hands about. But everybody that's coming in, that's moving into this community, no matter what they look like, no matter what language they speak, no matter what weird things they're into, God wants them, and he put this church here to reach them. And so we've got to be that for this world. Amen? Paul tells the leaders of the church in Ephesus that the Holy Spirit is leading the church, redeemed by Christ's blood. Not individuals redeemed by Christ's blood. You are. But he made a church redeemed by Christ's blood. That means that Jesus died to create community. Jesus died to create a community. That's what we're looking for in the world around us. If you heard me preach last week at the 930 service, we, more than anything else broken in our society right now, we are in a crisis of community. In every generation, in every ethnicity, in every socioeconomic status, we are more isolated, we are more divided, we are more disconnected from institutions, good or bad, than we've ever been in the history of our country. And this world needs a place where they can experience the community that God made them for. I mean, people are going so desperate to find community, they're finding it in video game groups, they're finding it in gyms, like that's where their biggest social group is. They need you to be a place where they can lean on somebody, where someone will walk with them, where somebody will forgive them when they do the wrong thing. We've got to be a community. And this whole faith thing, it's not something we're meant to do on our own. I think sometimes I feel guilty if I don't spend enough time in Scripture, if I don't spend enough time in prayer on my own. And God says, no, 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 I called you to do this together, and you will not, no matter how good you are at organizing your life and having a great schedule, you will not do it as well as you do in community. There's no skill that we try to be good at. There's no skill Uh, that you're better at alone than you are with a group, whether it's a sport, you know, whether it's music. If you are spending time with people encouraging you in that skill, you'll get better, and the same is true for our faith life. Lastly, Paul said he's not guilty for anyone because he taught the whole purpose of God. So I'm going to give you guys the whole purpose of God. I preached an entire series when I first got here in January of 2020. Uh, It was based on Brian Russell's GPS model for how we can understand Scripture and the story that God is telling, and it's this. God is on a global mission to put people in community and spiritually transform them. So when you read through Scripture, when you see Israel, when you see the Exodus, when you see the book of Psalms, when you see what's going on in the exile or what Jesus is doing, it was God on a global mission to put people in community to spiritually transform them. I hope that will give you a model of when you read a passage of Scripture to to put things into. Because you are called to be spiritually transformed, called to be in community, and called to be in mission to draw everybody in. This is your calling. This is every church's calling. Use whatever time you have left to do this. And if maybe circumstances are difficult for you where you're not mobile or you don't have the energy or you don't have the health to be out in the community, even if, if all you can do is pray and read and write letters and make phone calls, do that. You can change the world. So let each one of us change the world. You have the faith. You have the power through the Holy Spirit. And this purpose is all that matters. It's what the world needs. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.
And in honor of that, as a tradition here, that we'll have a pastor that's moving on, we sing, God be with you till we meet again. So can we sing one verse of that? If you need the words, it's in your hymnal, um, page 672. So please sing along with me. God be with you till we meet Um, before Alex offers us the benediction, um, I want to uh, invite you to pray with me as I pray for Alex and his family as they go on to their next journey with the orchard. Uh, so if you would join me in a word of prayer. Dear loving and gracious God, we are thankful for the mission and ministry that, off, that Alex has offered to us here at the Snellville United Methodist Church. We know that as the family of faith, that we never leave, that we are always heart connected, but we do pray for his family as they enter into the orchard and into this new community. May they be well received. May they extend love and grace and mercy and hope to one another as they journey into this new fellowship together. Guide and direct and hold him. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Let me move out here. When Jim retired, it was a huge blow to the average height of the pastoral staff. And... <laughs> None of us can see over David. So, uh, uh, 
Go in the grace of Jesus Christ, transformed by his love, turning around, going the other direction, filled with his spirit to show God's love to this community. God can transform anything, and he can build a community in the midst of the most broken situations. And so he can do that here, and he can build an amazing community that changes people's lives and send us out on mission to continue making disciples of Christ and sending, sending people out in ministry vocationally and just in their regular work life. Don't give it up. Give it everything you have for the rest of your lives. Go in peace. Amen.